Welcome to Straight Scripture, No Sugar. This is a Bible sermon series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy Word is truth. John 17, 17. Deuteronomy 32, 4. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is He. Proverbs 35. Every word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar. So if you have the truth, you have an absolute foundation to build your life on, to set your footsteps firm, okay, to have your steps established, as it says in Psalm 40, as opposed to stepping on shifting sand, which is the way of the world, where everybody's right, nobody's wrong, and there are no absolutes. You need to have absolutes in your life if you're going to have sure footing. You need truth. That's why here you're getting straight scripture, no sugar. So today's sermon topic is brainless believers, brainless believers. So I deliberately made it a question because it is indeed a question that we're going to answer here in this sermon. Can you truly believe in Christ without really having any knowledge of who he is or what he did? Now, it seems like the answer is pretty obvious to that question. However, it is just truly amazing how many quote-unquote brainless believers there are out there in the world, if there is such a thing. So let's get into it with the most famous gospel verse in the world, pretty much the one that everybody knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, 16 to 17. Okay, this is the verse you always see at sporting events or at any big event that's televised around the world. You always see John 3, 16, John 3, 16. Well, all of Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. So every man may be perfect and complete and equipped for every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, okay? So if all of Scripture is true, then of course John 3, 16 is true. However, it makes it sound very easy to come to Christ. All you have to do is believe and you'll have everlasting life, okay? Now, alright, so that's true, but it seems very, very easy, alright? So let's see the picture that Jesus paints about salvation, about coming to faith in Him. Okay, I'm going to Luke 13 here. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you. Where are you from? Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you. Where you are from, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Luke 13, verses 24 to 28. Okay, now, that paints a picture that seems to be the polar opposite of the John 3, 16, 17 verses. They say all you need to do is believe. Jesus says, strive to enter by the narrow gate, okay? And the Greek term basically means agonize, okay? So it's incredibly difficult, and the gate is narrow, and there are going to be people who try to get in and won't be able to. Okay, then the master who is Jesus on the other side is going to say, I don't know you. I don't know you. Depart from me. You practice lawlessness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's hell. That's hell. Okay? So Jesus, by his own account, says it's very difficult. Okay? It's very difficult to be saved. You have to strive to enter by this narrow gate. Okay? It's very, very difficult. You have to agonize to get in. And then there are going to be people who want to get in but can't. Okay? And they're going to end up in hell. What's going on here? 
Well, let's go further. <clears throat> Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Matthew 10, verses 34 to 36. Okay, Jesus, Jesus once again is talking about the price of salvation here. It could cost you your family relationships. It could sever your familiar relationships with siblings, with parents. It's going to cause rift and divisions, sharp divisions, in families. That's why he says, I have not come to bring peace but a sword. Okay, let's go even further. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give? in exchange for his soul. Matthew 16, 24 to 26. Okay, now he's going even further. It requires self-denial. You gotta pick up your cross and follow him. Now you always hear the expression, well I really have this cross to bear on my job, or I really have this cross to bear in my marriage, or what have you. It's basically become a metaphor for suffering. But Jesus, when he's talking about picking up your cross, He's talking about being willing to die for him. Because in his day, the cross was an instrument of capital punishment that the Romans used to make a public display of those who committed capital crimes. Okay, It was the equivalent of the gas chamber or inoculation or the electric chair that, that we use today. Okay, It was an instrument of capital punishment. And Jesus basically suffered um, on the cross, okay? But it's an instrument of capital punishment. That's what was used to make a public display of the most abjectly wicked, evil lawbreakers in Roman society because it was supposed to be a deterrent to crime, okay? But it's an instrument of death. You've got to be willing to die for him. You've got to practice self-denial. You try to save your life, you're going to lose it. You lose your life for his sake, you'll save it, okay? Wow, all right, this sounds a lot more difficult than what John, you know, John's verses say, that all you have to do is believe in him. All right, let's get into a couple more verses. Whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple, Luke 14, 33. Okay, you got to be willing to give up everything you have. Does it mean you have to? No, but you have to be willing, okay? Now, there's an interesting comparison that Jesus makes in Luke 18 to Luke 19. Uh, in Luke 18, he confronts the rich young ruler who says, you know, what do I need to attain eternal life? Jesus says, sell what you have and give it to the poor and, and come follow me. And he's unwilling because he's very wealthy and he goes away saddened, okay? But then in the next chapter, he meets Zacchaeus, the tax collector, Okay, he's just as rich as the rich young ruler, and before really Jesus does much of anything except say, I'm going to have lunch at your house today, Zacchaeus says, Lord, I will pay back those I have defrauded four times over, and I will give away half of what I have to the poor. And Jesus says, this house has been saved. Okay, so that great comparison that the Holy Spirit sets up in Luke 18 and Luke 19 shows us right there that you do not have to be a destitute beggar to believe in Christ and put your faith in Christ as Lord. No, you don't have to give up everything you have. The reason Jesus asked the rich young ruler to do it, or told him he needed to do it, because he made an idol out of money. He was putting something before his relationship with Christ. Christ has to come first, okay? So you do need to be willing to give up what you have, but what he means is he's got to have the number one position. And if something else is getting in the way, you got to be willing to get rid of it, like the rich young ruler who was unwilling. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12. Okay, this is Paul writing to Timothy. Okay, 
but you also need to be willing to be persecuted, okay? Unjustly ridiculed and reviled and criticized viciously, okay? So, there's a clear dichotomy going on here, or it seems like there's a dichotomy. John says in John chapter 3, all you have to do is believe in Jesus. Jesus says, you got to be willing to die for me, okay? Through Paul, he says, you got to be willing to be persecuted. You got to be willing to give up what you have. You got to be willing to give up familial relationships, okay? You got to be willing to go to the cross. You got to deny yourself. You got to strive to enter by this narrow gate, and even people who want to get in will not be able. Okay, how do we reconcile these two things? In one sense, it sounds like it's easy to believe in Christ as Lord. In another sense, Crump coming straight from the horse's mouth, or Jesus himself, it sounds like it's very, very difficult. Well, we can kind of resolve this if we look into Jesus' ministry and the great multitudes who were following him. We can get some insight into this. And we can resolve this apparent paradox or this apparent dichotomy, which really isn't a paradox, but requires deeper, deeper study. Okay, this is from Matthew 15. Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Then great multitudes, great multitudes came to him having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Matthew 15, verses 29 to 31. All right, great multitudes are following him. Great multitudes, thousands upon thousands, okay? Huge crowds. And it says elsewhere in Scripture that the crowds were so great that people were stepping on each other, on each other and, and jostling each other, okay? And what's he do, doing? He's healing all these people. Now, he cured the sick and cast out demons as well. But this healing is healing of people who have permanent permanent wounds or permanent um, lesions or permanent impairments of their bodies, okay? The lame, people who can't walk. The blind, people who can't see. The mute, people who can't talk, okay? All right, so the, the maimed, the mute, the blind, okay? The lame, people who can't walk, people who can't talk, people who may have lost digits on their toes or on their hands, okay? What does he do? He heals all of them, and he makes makes the lame walk. He makes the blind see. He makes the maimed whole, okay? So he's restoring people who have permanent, permanent wounds or permanent, permanent impairments, okay? This isn't just people who have some sort of temporary sickness, okay? And they're praising God. He's healing all of them. The great multitudes are following him, okay? So let's go further. Now, I'm going to John chapter 6. This is after he feeds 5,000 men with only five biscuits and two fish, okay? He actually, it's more than that. So there are 5,000 men, but we have to assume that there are women and children there as well, so... If one man has a wife and two ch children, it could have been up to 20,000 people, okay? And he feeds them with two fish and five little biscuits, okay? What do these men say to him after he performs this incredible miracle? Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. John 6.15. Okay. Now, we get some insight here. They want to take him and make him king by force. They want him to create a welfare state. They're looking for a genie in a bottle to feed them without them having to lift a finger. It's like being a bird in a nest, you know. 
an infant bird in a nest where the mother comes with the worm and just drops it in their mouth. All they have to do is open their mouth. That's who these people are looking for. Okay, that's who these people are looking for in this quote-unquote savior, a genie in a bottle who can create a welfare state and create food for them. They try to seize him and make him king by force. Okay, does this sound like true belief? Okay, does this sound like true belief in the savior who gives everlasting life to those who believe in him? Does this sound like true belief? deep down in the heart, or is it something different? Is it something far more shallow and superficial and worldly? I mean, think about the prosperity gospel today. It's no different. Jesus wants you healthy. He wants you wealthy. He wants you prosperous. Does he? Does he? Let's go further. Okay, we're going further down in the gospel of John chapter 6. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set, has set His seal on Him. John chapter 6, verses 25 to 27. Okay, Jesus says it Himself. This is the next morning, by the way. They come and they find Him on the Sea of Galilee. They chase Him down in boats, okay? And they say, when did you come here? He's like, you only came here because you had your bellies filled with the loaves. You're only interested in this welfare state. You're only interested in this genie in a bottle who can give you free food. But I tell you, okay, I am the bread of everlasting life, okay? I am here to give you everlasting life, spiritual life, eternal life, eternal life, not be your genie in a bottle who's going to heal all of your illnesses and your diseases and, and make the lame walk and the blind see and, and give you this free food, give you something for nothing, okay? I'm here to give you everlasting life. I'm the bread of life, okay? And he goes on to talk, talk about being the bread of life, that he is in fact the bread of life and whoever comes to him will never hunger or thirst, okay? Because he will give them eternal life, salvation, everlasting life, okay? Freedom from sin, okay? Everlasting life, okay? Freedom from the debt of sin. Freedom from hell. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about him being the Savior, Him being the Savior. What does He save from? He doesn't save from a lack of food. He doesn't save from disease. He doesn't save from an unfulfilled life or a purpose, purposeless life. He saves from hell, from eternal torment in which there's no escape, like He talked about in the Luke verses, okay? There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, okay? That's what he's saving from. Eternal separation from God in an eternal state of torment. That's what he saves us from, okay? That's what he saves us from. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 118. Okay, why am I throwing that in there? This Old Testament verse that seems to come out of nowhere. Okay, let us reason together. God wants you to use your mind. Use your mind, okay? Who is Jesus really? Is he this temporal genie in a bottle? Or is he the eternal Savior who offers everlasting life? You gotta use your mind, okay? Brainless believers 
Are there brainless believers? God says we need to reason this thing out. That doesn't sound brainless to me. Okay, let's see what Paul says to the Ephesian church. Very similar, okay? You should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 18, okay? Now, this is a different audience. This is a Gentile audience. This is not the Jews who are following Jesus, obviously, but they have the same mindset, okay? They're ignorant, okay? They're ignorant. They're not interested in listening, listening to the message of Christ, that he is the bread of life, that he is speaking of spiritual matters, that he is the one who offers everlasting life and escape from hell, okay? And escape from eternal damnation. They're not interested in that. They want a genie in a bottle who's going to stuff and fill their bellies and it's going to cure their diseases and cure their impairments, okay? And cure their physical and cure their physical ailments, okay? We need to reason this through. We need to think this through. All right. Now, let's talk about what else, what else Jesus says in Luke 13. All right, he's talking about what happens to those who die suddenly and unexpectedly. Listen to this. Those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Luke 13, 4. Okay, so Jesus is talking about these people who are working on this tower. All of a sudden it falls on them and kills them. Okay, what's going on there? Was that some judgment by God because they were some sort of extreme sinners who God needed to judge? No, the point he's making is we're all sinners and none of us know when we're going to die. So unless we repent and we turn from our wicked ways and put ourselves underneath Christ, what's going to happen? Damnation, okay? Perish, that's what that means. All right, let's go on to what he says in Mark chapter 9. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Mark chapter 9, verses 47 to 48. Okay? That's pretty graphic, all right? Where the worm does not die, where the fire is not quenched, being cast into eternal hellfire, okay? If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. So what's he talking about there? Is he saying, well, there's, there's no atonement? You know, if, if you commit these sins, you're going to be in hell? No. He's saying you have to deal with sin very, very seriously. Very, very seriously, okay? Sin basically separates us from God. And the only atonement for sin, the only acceptable sacrifice for sin, is Jesus. That's why he talks about himself as the bread of life. That's why he says he offers everlasting life. Because he is the only acceptable sacrifice for sin. Okay? And we need to put ourselves underneath him as Lord. Okay? to recognize that He only can bring us to God. Only He can bring us to God. Alright? He's the only way. He's the only way. And we need to come, come underneath Him as Lord. For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Alright, there it is right there. We're all sinners. We inherited the sin principle from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and we're all guilty of it. So if you've ever lied, cheated, stolen anything, lusted after somebody else's car, house, wife, position in this world, and we all have, we're all guilty of sin. And it says all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory, okay? There are not some who are exempt. We're all sinners. We inherited the sin principle from Adam and Eve. 
For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Okay, God puts all of the sin that's ever committed for all of believing humanity before and after the cross on Jesus' shoulders at the cross. Okay, Isaiah 53.5 He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The penalty for our peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. Okay, God makes his son pay the sin debt for all of believing humanity before and after the cross. So when he looks at the believer who confesses him as Lord, he sees his son, okay? And that makes us righteous in God's eyes because we have put ourselves underneath Christ and confessed him as Lord to pay the sin debt. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10.9. Okay, there it is. Romans 10.9. You confess him as Lord, which means you understand that he made the sin payment in full on the cross for your sin, and only he was the one who was capable of doing it, because only he is the man who knew no sin. Once you recognize this, and you recognize your sin, and you confess him as Lord, you are in fact saved, okay? You are in fact saved, okay? This is how you receive everlasting life. This is how you will never perish, okay? By confessing Christ as Lord, okay? So now we're getting some insight into the John 3, 16 and 17 verses. They're true, okay? But... What Jesus said about being willing to die, about being willing to sever familiar relationships, about being willing to give up all that you have, is also true, okay? But the John 3.16 verses assume an understanding. That's the key. There's an, um, there's an assumption there that if you believe in Christ, you believe that you're a sinner. You believe that you can't atone for your own sin. You believe that only the man who knew no sin can atone for your sin, and you confess him as Lord, okay? You believe in all of that, and in so doing, you will walk in obedience to Christ. You will do what he says. Now, listen to this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Ezekiel 36 verses 26 to 27. Okay, this is the Old Testament promise of the New Testament reality when you confess Jesus as Lord. What happens? He gives you a new heart and a new spirit. He puts your His Holy Spirit within you, okay? He puts His Holy Spirit within you, which causes you to keep His judgments and keep His commandments, okay? So that means you will walk in obedience to Him, even if it means it could cost you your life, even if it means self-denial, even if it means persecution, even if it means you're going to be mistreated, even if it means you may have to sever relationships with family, okay? This is what's going on, all right? So this is where we get some insight into what it means to really believe in Christ, all right? You will sacrifice. You will suffer. You will be willing to be persecuted. You will strive to enter by that narrow gate, okay? Because that is the nature of true belief and true salvation. And... God will give you His Spirit to go through those difficulties in a life of belief. Not only that, He'll give you the strength to do it. Because once you have His Holy Spirit, you have the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. That's Isaiah 11 too. Okay, those are the attributes of the Holy Spirit. 
And when you confess Christ as Lord, you will have those in your heart. So you do not only just live in obedience, you don't just keep his laws and his statutes, but you have his understanding, you have his knowledge, you have his strength to do so. And you will persevere through trials, through tribulations, through persecutions, through self-denial, through rifts with your family. Okay, you will persevere when you have to agonize to enter by that narrow way. You will persevere even if it means your own life. Or even if it means you have to give up what you have if he asks you to. Okay, and you will have his indwelling Holy Spirit to empower you, to guide you, to give you wisdom and knowledge along the way. Yet the righteous will hold to his way. And he who has clean hands will be stronger and stronger. Job 17.9. Okay? That's also what will happen when you confess Christ as Lord. Okay? You will persevere. You will persevere through your entire life. No matter what comes at you. No trial. No tribulation. Not even death. Nothing will be able to take away your faith and your perseverance and your walk with the Lord Christ. Nothing will be able to do that, okay? And you'll get stronger and stronger in your faith. So, let's get back to the original question. Brainless believers? Brainless believers? Is there such a thing? No, there is not. There's no such thing as the brainless believer. In fact, the believer, the true believer, is brainy. The true believer has understanding. The true believer sees his or her sin, sees it as a permanent rift between himself and herself and God, and sees Jesus as the only way, the bread of life, okay, the Savior of everlasting life, who reconciles us to God. And he or she desperately sees his or her need to confess Christ as Lord. And when he or she does, he or she will have eternal life. And he or she will be willing to suffer, to sacrifice, to endure persecution, to strive to enter by that narrow gate, to leave family and friends behind if necessary, to be willing to suffer and sacrifice unto death if necessary, to be willing to give up what Jesus asks them to, if necessary, okay? Now, that does not mean that God does not provide all our needs according to the riches of His glory in Christ. He does, Philippians 4.19. He promise, promises, as it says in Matthew 6, to provide us with food, with clothing, with shelter. He promises to meet our needs, okay? He's not going to leave us uh, destitute, all right? But the assumption is if he's going to provide for us, we need to be walking in his ways. We need to be walking in obedience to him if he's going to provide for us. And when we truly believe, when we truly believe, he will give us everything that we need. Now, in some cases, it's just what you know, it's just the basics. With others, he makes other people rich, but it's so they can fulfill his calling on their life, okay? Now, God gives more to some than others, but that's his will, and that is his call, all right? It's not our call, but by no means, as believers, are we going to be destitute, because God put us on this earth to serve Him, to fulfill His purpose in our lives, to advance His kingdom. And we can't do that if we're devoid of resources. That's why He says in Matthew 30, or 6, 33, Don't worry about your life. Seek the kingdom and His righteousness, and these things shall be added to you. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be seeking His kingdom. We need to be serving. We need to be using our spiritual gifts, which He will give us through His Holy Spirit, at the point of salvation, to advance the kingdom of God 
and give Him glory. So I say thank you so much for listening. This series is called Straight Scripture, No Sugar. Once again, it's a Bible series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. You can watch any of these sermons online through the URL. It's getbibletruth.com. And I say thank you so much for listening. My name is John Parisi. God bless you. Amen.